Welcome back. It's Ed Martin. We're here. I'm Ed Martin, by the way. I might say a couple times, and you can find all of us. John Schlafly's here, Ryan Height, Jordan Henry, on our phyllisschlafly.com website. Uh, all the contact information's there. 28th annual Phyllis Schlafly Collegians uh, Summit, and uh, virtual again next year. I promise we're going to be in person. We're all looking forward to it. Let's go. Keep going. We've got some great... We've had a number of congressmen and senators with us. Now we're into some of the policy issues that uh, you collegians need to pay attention to, if I can say that. And hopefully you'll be interested. Our next guest is Todd Benzman. Todd Benzman is the Senior National Security Fellow at the Center for Immigration Studies. CIS.org is their website. If you go there and click through to him, he keeps a uh, he posts his regular articles and essays he writes, and it's an update a lot of times from the border. His recent book is America's Covert Border War, The Untold Story of the Nation's Battle to Prevent Jihadist Infiltration. I have that book on my bookshelf. I read it. It's really good. It's really interesting. And he's uh, someone who has been writing about the border and writing about the immigration issue for years, and now he's at the center of what's only can be described as an, a border crisis. So welcome, Todd. How are you? I'm great having me. I'm happy to be here. Good. Thank you, Todd. So, Todd, we're talking to college students. So there's lots of people watching virtually that are, are not students. So we know we've got thousands of people, but we're aiming at a college students. How do you describe to young people what's happening at the border? You know, you've, you've watched it for years and years now, but what if you were to say land in a, a sophomore of college uh, poli sci class, describe the border and the issues around it and what's happening? Yeah, um, so I've spent a lot of time at the border. I've uh, made four different trips to the border in the last uh, couple of months and spent good time down there. And I'd have to say that that we are most definitely in a uh, border crisis as uh, that would be identifiable by volumes of apprehensions, uh, the number of people that are actually uh, crossing and coming into contact with American uh, border Patrol or officials being caught, uh, encountered. And um, I would say that over the years, just for uh, context, that, you know, this sort of ebbs and flows. We have, you know, spikes and, and lows and spikes and lows. Uh, but that what is really different about this time is in the past, usually federal government and the administrations, uh, the, the whoever occupies the White House, is opposed to this kind of this level of mass migration it happens in spite of their efforts their best efforts to stop it uh, but in this case I think it's historic in that uh, this particular administration has decided to encourage this mass migration and to create the conditions that make for a ripe uh, invitation for people to come in, especially family units and children. Uh, the administration has made it clear through words, deed, action, that family units, uh, people that are coming in uh, in groups of, you know, uh, with women, mothers, fathers, children, uh, are welcome and will be very quickly legalized and sent off to their way into the interior. And that is a really unusual uh, position to take, a very different kind of thing that's happening, uh, where the uh, administration is talking about uh, their idea of managing this border is to make it easier, to, to make it efficient, the, the conveyor belt of people pouring into the country. Again, we're talking with Todd Benzman, CIS.org. You can go to the website of the Center for Immigration Studies. Todd, a lot of our college students, you know, just college campuses in general, they w they get the argument, the pro-immigration argument, that the that the um, the issue, you know, we should be uh, uh, opening our borders, that people want to come to America because it's such a great place, and who are we to have anything, you know, thought otherwise? And obviously, the last four years of Donald Trump has changed the conversation, at least. But how do you how do you how how would you talk about countering that argument that you know uh, immigration is just something people want to do and when they do it it's, it's it turns out good for everybody in the end yeah everything you said is uh, put out there by illegal immigration advocates it's true uh, but you left one uh, significant argument that they make out and that is that if you 
uh, don't want that to happen if you are opposed to just <laughs> yeah. unobstructed uh, illegal immigration over the border that you are a racist. Right. Because a majority of the folks that are coming in happen to be Latino, uh, speaking Spanish. Uh, and so if you are opposed to that particular uh, kind of event, you're a racist. Uh, what I tell people uh, to as, as framing for arguing about the relative um, need for a country to control its borders is twofold. One is that all nations on earth, and I mean horizontally over uh, like all countries and through history, laterally, uh, all dating all the way back to ancient times, have borders. They seek to control who comes and who goes, who sometimes even who leaves uh, in their country. And that is a matter of sovereignty. That is a basic question of whether a nation can exercise its identity as a territory with in integrity, with laws and rule of law within uh, its, its territorial boundaries. And uh, when you reduce your willingness or eliminate your willingness to enforce those boundaries, then you no longer have boundaries. You are just simply, uh, you know, a, a piece of ground that anybody can come and go on. And that's just not the way any nation on earth has ever operated. No countries do that. All countries expect, and the people that live within those countries expect defense of their resources and their people and regulation of who comes and who goes. It's just a basic issue of sovereignty, not racism. Uh, the other issue, which goes to, Ed, what you were saying to me about, uh, you know, these people just want to come. Uh, th this country, uh, in line with that and the issue of sovereignty, is a nation of rules and laws. There is a legal system for legal immigration. And the big problem with having just uninhibited illegal immigration is that you 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 are undermining your legal system completely you are you are disrespecting it you are reducing it to a kind of a joke and there are a lot of people in the world who want to do the right thing who want to follow the laws who want to respect the nation that is allowing them to come in and when you throw the gates open to extra legal immigration or illegal immigration over the borders, all of that is gone. Uh, and it's a, an affront to all of the men and women, millions, uh, who have done it the legal way. Uh, so if you want to argue that people who want to come here should be allowed to come here because we live in a great nation and they don't, uh, the encouragement should be to do it the legal way. Mm -hmm. If there's not enough capacity, <clears throat> then you go to Congress and you, or the White House and you ask them to increase the capacity, bring more in. That's a legitimate policy argument and a policy question. Uh, so when the R word comes out, as it inevitably does, for anybody who wants to reduce illegal immigration is that we want to protect our national sovereignty, which every nation on earth now and through history expects. It's a fundamental right. Uh, and do it the legal way because there are so many people who have done it the legal way. And those people are, if you've ever talked to somebody who's done it the legal way, they are absolutely outraged to see people just in ten, by the tens of thousands coming over the border when they waited their turn in line, paid the fees, filled out the paperwork, did everything the right way, and respected the country. 
Again, we're talking with Todd Benzman. Todd is the national, the Senior National Security uh, Fellow at the Center for Immigration Studies. CIS.org is the website. His book, again, is Covert, America's Covert Bo- Border War, The Untold Story of the Nation's Battle to Prevent Jihadist Infiltration. infiltration. Todd has been a, 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 Todd, you've been a journalist, right? So a lot of our collegians are out there and they're saying, hey, I might like to be a journalist. I like to, uh, I like to write or I like to post on videos. And I, I think it would be fun to be a, a journalist of some kind. You, you were you were at all the many of the big mainstream uh, journalism uh, outfits and all. Uh, here's a question I want to ask you. Uh, you can see because you have a sense of the issues. You can see how uh, a story like the border and the crisis at the border is being ignored by the media. I mean, they're really, if this was a story under a Republican or just in general, this would be, a, you know, this would be an ongoing daily story, I think, right now. We've got all the, all of the specific, all the kind of um, characteristics of a, of a good story, meaning there's uh, sex trafficking involved, there's uh, family separation, there's corruption, uh, there's get crime. I mean, it's like a HBO miniseries, and yet there's yeah. no coverage. What, what do you say? You're, you're one of the few people actively writing about it. It's good for you because you become an expert. But how do you describe to college students that this is not real news? We're not watching a normal news setup. Big tech has decided they won't allow uh, stories that they don't think fit the narrative to be highlighted and probably to be promoted anyway. How do you describe to college kids that this is a sort of a, a weird new world? That's a great way to put it, Ed. It is a very weird new world. Uh, I left journalism in 2009. Uh, I worked at major newspapers like the Dallas Morning News for 10 years and Hearst News and CBS. So I was in the mainstream regular. My my undergraduate degree is in journalism. Uh, One of my master's degree is in journalism. Uh, I am classically trained in uh, the ethics and practice of journalism, of the craft. Uh, but so I would say that um, that is now old school. Uh, I, I'll, I'll, let, me just, let me just throw this um, anecdote out there. In all of those newspapers that I worked for, those news organizations that I worked for, almost everyone, editors all the way down to you know, the interns were politically liberal. Uh, you could tell over time if you'd been in an organization and got to talking to people over time uh, where they stood on issues and how they voted. And that's just not my personal uh, feeling or opinion at the places that I work. There have been studies done over the years of uh, journalism staffs. They vote in Democratic primaries. Uh, and it used to be that you know we were required uh, under penalty of, uh, f- you know, termination, leading up to termination, uh, to maintain neutrality and even the appearance of neutrality, even the perception. We couldn't have a bumper sticker on a car. We couldn't have a yard sign with a candidate's name on it. There was an ethics code. Uh, that is no longer the case. I don't see that anymore. They may uh, claim at the New York Times and the Post that they do these things. But I think what's happened is the uh, newsroom staffs of today in the old legacy corporate media have just <clears throat> given way completely to their sort of animalistic political instincts. And so we see uh, those staffs ruling over the, um, the editors even. They can get them fired. They can uh, hold... Uh, you know, rallies in the newsroom and that sort of thing. We couldn't do that. That was unheard of in my day. But the other thing is that uh, they get they they pick and choose stories that are based on their political bias. And liberals tend to like mass illegal immigration. They're fine by it. They're good with it. Uh, and um, journalists don't want to report things that are uncomfortable about it. The dangers involved in it. The fact that there are criminals coming in and dope dealers and traffickers and uh, the totality of what's going on there. And they can choose not to cover it at all. And I think that during the Donald Trump reign, they covered it. They were very interested in covering a particular aspect of it. We all saw that. 
there have been studies of what got covered under the Trump administration, namely anything at all that would that would reflect poorly on that particular president. This particular president is getting a kind of treatment that is um, an equal opposite, which is to sort of avoid, you know, the fact that there are tens of thousands of people being allowed to conveyor belt into the country, uh, which and 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 not just allowed but encouraged and facilitated. This is something historic. That is an amazing story uh, that's not being told down there. And um, all I can say is. Uh, there are a few of us that are down there. Um, there are some conservative news outlets that are down there. Watch out for them, too, uh, because everybody's a little bit biased. Uh, but, you know, this is not going to get covered. This this crisis is not going to get covered the way it would if Donald Trump was in office. <clears throat> Um, again, we're talking with Todd Bensman, CIS.org, and you can click on his name and you'll see his writings. And uh, he's got kind of a blog there as well as posting his essays. Uh, Todd, I'm a 22-year-old college student, though, let's say, and I'm thinking about a job in journalism. Are we just back to a time where you have to pick a, a journalist, um, uh, a, a, an, an entity that just has your views? You know, like 120 years ago in St. Louis, the city I'm from, you know, there was, uh, I don't know, 80 papers. There was a conservative German paper. There was a liberal Italian paper. Is that what journalism has devolved into? I mean, again, if you if you go and watch uh, journalists, um, you see a bunch of people migrating to Substack. You see others going over to Locals.com to do video content and kind of self-selecting uh, to places. Is that the future of journalism? Is that what uh, 22 year olds should be saying? Or, or do you go to a policy think tank that gives you the freedom to cover the, the story and go where it goes like uh, CIS does? What, what's, your, what's your advice to college students? Yeah, I mean, look, it's it's a really different world now than when I was coming up back in the 80s and 90s, uh, just to date myself. Uh, uh, but the the I have to say, I mean, you I think that the media landscape uh, is so fractured along has so uh, willingly uh, the 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 overseers of journalism have just given up completely. Uh, you can see the New York Times trying to claim neutrality, but they are not. They are just not in their basic news coverage. The Washington Post, like these are like the gray, the gray lady, uh, the great, uh, you know, the Washington Post of Woodward and Bernstein are no more, in my opinion, they just aren't. And so I would have to say, if you wanna practice journalism, uh, I hate to say this, but you kind of have to go where your political leanings are. And there are a great many uh, news outlets that you can choose from. If you're uh, feeling kind of liberal and, uh, you know, you can go try to get a job with the Daily Beast. <laughs> I mean, you can name which publications are liberal and conservative uh, that lean that way in their choice of uh, news stories and in the way they write uh, about news stories that they don't have any choice but to cover, uh, in omission, uh, coverage by omission. Uh, anyway, um, I, that, that's a terrible thing to say, I, but I, I mean, if I was coming up, I would just pick, uh, and you feel conservative, go you know, pick a good conservative publication that will at least reduce conflict between you and your colleagues and editors because it, it, it is never any fun to be the only uh, conservative in a liberal newsroom <laughs> with, with liberal editors and who are stepping on your story ideas. Uh, and uh, the same goes the other way, too. Right. So uh, one, one last question, Todd, uh, about our, our theme for the, this Collegian Summit is the fight worth fighting. And, you know, when I go to CSI.org, the Center for Immigration Studies, the folks there, they clearly care about this issue. They're willing to go wherever it goes. They're willing to name whoever is worth naming, including Republicans, often Democrats, but they're not afraid. They're not on a team. They're, they're in that issue. 
The fight worth fighting for Center for Immigration Studies is the immigration fight because of what it means and what's happening. Why is that? Why, you know, tell our, our collegians why this issue, you know, some people wake up and they say, I want to, I really care about the abortion fight, or I care about judges, or I care about election integrity. And we've got some speakers on all those subjects. The thing that you're spending your time on is immigration because it's the fight worth fighting. Why? Well, for a lot of reasons, uh, immigration, both legal and illegal, uh, impact huge policy areas that have nothing to do with the border. Uh, the economy, the labor market. Uh, it, it goes to uh, questions about uh, sovereignty and uh, our, you know, who, who are we, uh, our language, our culture, and it, it, it really hits on so many different uh, areas of civic life that it deserves to be uh, debated, discussed, researched, because we're an open society and, you know, our people need to vote and select leaders and we need to ask those leaders to, to make decisions, hard decisions sometimes. Uh, look, you know, the United States of America, in my opinion, is in a lot of people's opinion, is the greatest country in the world that the world has ever seen. Uh, I spend a lot of time with immigrants I understand, and I, I spend time with immigrants in Latin America on their way here, and I certainly can understand why they want to come here, why they are doing anything they have to do to the point of endangering their children and their own lives to get here, because we're just that great. It's just that great of a place to live, and especially in comparison to other places, and when you really spend a lot of time with those people, you really come to appreciate country we have here and why they want it so much. But uh, we, as citizens, have a an absolute right to decide how many come in, who comes in, and to have a rule a set of laws and policies that we all agree should be in place for this particular time that we live in uh, because it affects so many different strata of, of civic life. It just does. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to see very shortly, for example, uh, in our school districts across the country, uh, you know, uh, uh, an increase in need for, you know, mobile classrooms to put in the, in the back on the back 40 and ESL <laughs> teachers and tax rates that are going to have to go up to pay for this. Uh, and that's just one small element hmm. of illegal immigration. Right. We have a right to say that's the, that's the fight that we fight, Center for Immigration Studies. We provide information to make our electorate informed on these matters. Yep. All right, Todd Benzman, thank you very much. If you go to cis.org, you'll see Todd's work. Again, he's the uh, Senior National Security Fellow at the Center for Immigration Studies. His book, recent book is America's Covert Border War. Uh, check it out. Thank you, Todd, for your time and for all you do over there. Uh, we're going to take